there. I think we are going live and I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm standing right next to our backyard, our garden, and our amazing gardeners are here. So I hope it's not too loud. I'm trying to back up into the corner here, but thank you for joining me live. If we haven't met, my name is Julie Hirschberg. I am a neurologic physical therapist, the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness. I'm in the Los Angeles area and oh, Hello and best wishes from Germany. Awesome, I'm so glad you're here. We have such an amazing community that joins me live every week. So today we're gonna to talk about cervical dystonia and particularly where to start. And it is because I had a physical therapist reach out to me. She is actually taking our FND mini course and submitted a question, which I love. You know I love a good question. So I'm actually gonna grab it here. Um, so she sent me a question asking about a patient um, with cervical dystonia. So if you're not familiar with cervical dystonia, it's dystonia affecting the muscles in the neck. This particular patient has an anterocollis and a torticollis. So dystonia in the neck, the, the, the neck moves in many directions. So it can bring your head forward, bring your head back, uh, tilting to the side or in rotation. And one of the most difficult um, combinations of that is actually an anterior or retrocollis. Um, so this is this is the patient that she's hearing about, anterior collis, torticollis. Um, and she's already made some progress, which is just like, yes, therapy. Therapy is so helpful in dystonia. So I love hearing that um, they've been doing some manual therapy because a lot of times the muscles are tight. You need to address that. Um, and can get the head to neutral, which is amazing. Um, and they've also added in some autonomic pieces, awesome, um, some strengthening pieces, some uh, sensory pieces such as TENS, um, and have found some sensory tricks. Um, there are also some psychosocial pieces that are contributing, um, which is not surprising. Anybody with dystonia is not um, typically functioning at their, their highest capacity and it's frustrating and stressful um, for people. Um, but this person has some great support, which I love to hear as well. So just asking for tips. And whenever I get a case, I always wanna go back to the beginning what, where do we start with this? And today I shared a post. Let me just um, share a piece of it here because where I start is always the screening. I want to understand what type of dystonia am I working with here? There's dystonia associated with Parkinson's, for example. And does this person have undiagnosed Parkinson's? And I don't want to screen that. I'm going to assume not. Cervical dystonia is not very common in that. Task-specific dystonia, not very common in Parkinson's. I'm going to assume not. But these are the things where I would start because it does change a little bit of what we do. Although I will say across the board, regardless of the cause of dystonia, it's very responsive to rehabilitation. So I shared this post today to look at some of the pieces of both idiopathic dystonia, of which cervical dystonia is the most common, as well as functional dystonia, which you could also have functional cervical dystonia. And typically what I see is in people with uh, dystonia of any type, I see all, many layers. I see many pieces, uh, both idiopathic and functional dystonia components to it. And good news, they respond to therapy. But I do want to know and understand, particularly in cervical dystonia, cervical dystonia much more than other dystonias, an idiopathic cervical dystonia responds extremely well to Botox. And typically, if I see somebody with idiopathic cervical dystonia, I'm going to be collaborating with their movement disorder neurologist. So that's the other thing is I always, always, always recommend anybody with dystonia see a movement disorder neurologist. It's a specialized neurologist that specializes in movement disorders. By the way, there's physical therapists that specialize in movement disorders. We have a fellowship that trains physical therapists in movement disorders. Somebody is asking, can someone have both? I see both. I see many layers of things all of the time. Um, and it's, it, 
it is it is common um we know that certain disorders movement disorders especially because again there's a shared pathology and mechanism involving the basal ganglia sensory motor cortex we can see an overlap of both um both an idiopathic dystonia and a functional dystonia what a great question thank you for asking it um and how do we know this particular paper helps piece out what are those components so for this case um that this therapist shared with me i would really want to know um which pieces might be that repeatable pattern of muscle contractions i will usually use surface emg on the muscles to to look at their activity and is it um it, it's not usually variable so if you have cervical dystonia it's the same muscles that are um uh, they're just invariably contracting. In functional dystonia, we may see a variable pattern of muscle contractions. And we also see that the attention to the muscle contraction can change the, the symptoms. In idiopathic dystonia, sometimes actually the attention, like a sensory trick, can improve the symptoms. So that's very different, but we might see both. And again, we usually do. Now, then, if you're seeing both of those, or if you're seeing one, you're you're going to be able to put together a plan. And so I want to share um, kind of the first pie chart. This is the diagnostic pie chart. Um, so that first step when we're screening is to formulate, okay, how much of this is idiopathic dystonia? Uh, the cervical dystonia? How much of this is a functional dystonia? How much of this is disuse? How much of this, you know, sometimes we get long-term effects of Botox, weakening of the muscles. How much of this might be due to weakening of the muscles? Um, how much is due uh, to an old injury, for example? So that's the first step is I want to piece together that diagnosis piece. I don't make diagnoses as a neurologic physical therapist, but I do screen because this directs my treatment plan. Now, the second step, and I, I shared this earlier this week. Let me see if I can find the same image that I shared. Um, it was from our FND workbook uh, that I love, and it's something that we have, um, shoot, sorry. Um, looking for this particular page of this, but it was from the other day. And of course, I've shared many other pictures <laughs> before that. The second thing that I want to do. So first, I want to screen. What um, is contributing to this person's movement problem? Is there a uh, cervical dystonia? Is there functional dystonia as well? Again, often see them together. Are there other comorbid conditions? Then I really want to understand what does that person understand of their dystonia? So this is a page from our F&D workbook um, where, and we send this to every patient. We have them create their pie chart. We have them tell us how they understand their body. Nobody understands their body better than the person. I am not more of an expert by any means. So we ask them. This is really helpful because there are a, um, I find in a lot of folks that I, we work with, with dystonia, uh, runner's dystonia, um, writing cramp, um, tremors, as somebody is asking with tremors due, due to dystonia, they often have some great insight as to things that are contributing to it. So I think this is really important. So that's the second piece. Third is we go to our pie chart. Of course we go to our pie chart because in a complex case, um, of which I would say dystonia, functional neurologic disorders, they're pretty complex. And again, we're usually dealing with multiple diagnoses and multiple comorbid conditions. I want a framework. I want a framework for me to be able to um, understand that person and their symptoms. And in, in hearing from this therapist, they were already starting to see things um, in in different areas for sure so they talked about autonomic and they talked about sensory and here's where i'd want to know what are the assessments that you um that have kind of led you to that piece and i will be honest when i first started in cervical dystonia i read the literature it talked about sensory traits it talked about 
a challenge in sensory motor integration. I didn't know how to test that out really well. Things have improved. The literature has improved. I've learned things about testing out uh, the sensory system. And so I would want to know, particularly around the neck, what does the map of their neck look like? Do um, sensory localization discrimination testing around the neck. Um, what we see is either a person is really, really aware or they have a poor representation of their neck muscles, sometimes along the shoulders as well. So that would be one piece that I would really want to test out and see to go down that sensory route. It sounds like um, this therapist is already looking at sensory tricks and uh, tens and other things which can be really, really helpful in dystonia over the dystonic muscle. Another piece uh, that I often find is very helpful in cervical dystonia, also under the sensory realm, is looking at postural writing responses. So we have responses in our neck, in our trunk, that respond to postural changes. So I was like tipping back here, because if you look, you can like kind of see them in my neck, you'll see that my neck muscles turn on. If I tip forward, my neck muscles turn on. If I tip side to side. So I like to test those postural writing responses in sitting and standing and then bring that right into treatment because typically what I'll see is um, particularly the person with overactive uh, muscles in the front of their neck will see that in response to a postural we might get some automatic neck extension um, and if not, if that neck extension is really weak, I might add some electrical stimulation there. I'm going to do everything in my power to get the neck extensors activating. So um, I hope that gives you a couple of pieces in the, in the sensory pie chart. Um, the, the second piece uh, that you mentioned was autonomic. And again, I want to test this. We do heart rate variability testing, love it. And what I like to see is the, does the dystonia worsen when the heart rate variability um, goes down or vice versa? And so I uh, can't, can't know unless you test it, right? So we use something called the LEAF. It's a portable EKG and it tests heart rate variability. So we'll put that on. We'll take a look at that for people. Um, if you don't have something like that, you can use uh, like a watch, an Apple watch, a polar heart rate monitor also, and an app is, can be really helpful. Another thing before I had any of those tools is I would look at does their dystonia change when I change the input or the output of the autonomic nervous system. So um, something as simple as an extended exhale, which can be activating to the parasympathetic nervous system, I might see if their dystonia changes. I might do that with humming or singing. Very person specific, not everybody likes to hum or sing, but if they do, I, I might I uh, use that in that case as an autonomic influence. Um, we'll also look at other components that might regulate their um, autonomic nervous system. So compression and weighting would be one of those. Now, weighting also has a dual component in the sensory system. What is so nice about weighting, and again, test this out, then treat it, but we do see um, sometimes some vestibular changes in our folks with cervical dystonia because we know the eyes, the ears, uh, the vestibular system directly tell our head where to be. And so um, test it out. And if you see some discrepancies, you can absolutely treat that. I love using the subjective visual vertical um, as a test, but even joint position error testing would be great there. Um, so we got quite a few there. We've got sensory ideas, we've got autonomic ideas, um, and, and then of course the motor control pieces. So can you unlock in the person with dystonia, um, can you unlock automatic head movements. We talked about the postural writing responses. They're great for this. Um, but can you elicit extension in other positions? This is where I really, again, this is why step step two is really reaching in and understanding that person. Can you elicit it, it in a 
position that really brings that person joy. Now, if that was me, you would put me on a surfboard um, or a boogie board because I would get in prone and I'd automatically extend up. Um, and I wouldn't make the cue. I wouldn't ask the person, oh, can you extend your neck? I would just do the task and practice the task. Um, now, again, what we can see in prolonged dystonia is we can see weakness of muscles, or if a person has had Botox, weakness of muscles that might make it difficult to do some of the things like this. So um, you have to take that into consideration, which is why a very thorough assessment among each of these pieces of the pie is so, you, you really can't go into treatment without assessing that piece first, right? Like a hundred percent. I wanna go back um, to the chat I because I was talking so much here. I saw some comments, um, uh, content is so helpful. Good, good. Um, Great. So what a great insight here. Um, I live with FND and my point of breaking through is to think I do the movement I want and that helps me get in action. That is brilliant and so well said. Um, because we also know in FND and if there's a functional dystonia component for a person that... Um, the attention to the muscles, the attention to the position of the neck spirals in how, spirals of worsening of the movement. And so you have just articulated that so well. Um, thank you for that comment. And that is why um, we want to change the focus to exactly as you said, what's the action that I want? What's the goal? What's the goal orientation? Um, versus how um, uh, looking at the neck muscle and like, is it doing what it should? Because honestly, that is a not how our movement is organized in her brain. Our movement is organized to be goal directed. So goal directed treatment is so, so important. Can you turn on the surface EMG? Yeah, but I might not actually bring the person's attention to it. It might be feedback for me instead. Um, she also says, the brain doesn't know that I'm just thinking about the movement. Yes, I trick myself this way. And really, I love that. I know you're calling it a trick, but really you're reorienting your brain to the way it should be organized, which is a goal. That is how we learn and do things all day long. And it is when we have an injury, when we have a, a neurologic disorder, when we have pain, when we have abnormal contractions like in dystonia, we start directing our attention to those things. Of course we do. That is protective for us. Um, however, that be, can lead to a learned dysfunction and an abnormal movement pattern that we can see in dystonia and functional dystonia. Um, yes, and somebody else is also saying body awareness and acknowledgement of how I want to move is the best. Um, so, so brilliant. You all are fantastic. So um, that was in response to a really great question of a therapist who's going to be taking our FND course. And she submitted this question ahead of time um, because she's already working with somebody and wanting input. And I said, you know what? This deserves a video, so this is for you. And we're gonna keep learning and growing together in our F&D mini course, um, and literally every week here too. Um, but if you are a clinician, um, our F&D mini course is June 8th, live. We, um, Chelsea Richardson, our FND program director, and I have been working on this. We have all of these cases. I'm so excited. Seizures, tremor, dystonia, um, paralysis. We're bringing in all types of different uh, functional neurologic disorders um, and symptoms um, so that you could see the framework in action and have loads of assessment and treatment ideas for every type of functional neurologic disorder. Now, I do want to say this is not a dystonia course. Our FND course is not a dystonia course. Um, 
not all dystonia is functional uh, dystonia, um, although I will say a lot of dystonia that I see also has functional dystonia. So I see both a lot together and we'll, you'll learn in that Vindy mini course how to sort that out um, a little bit. What is functional? What is not? What are the comorbid conditions? Oh my goodness, I jumped into the literature today looking at um, hypermobility disorders, looking at autism, looking at mast cell activation syndrome. These are areas that I'm really interested in and that we see in a lot of folks with FND, um, POTS, so many things. So we're bringing all of that to our FND mini course. So join us. If you're a clinician, I hope you will join us. We want to empower clinicians all over the globe so that you um, could find uh Anybody can find an FND informed uh, therapist near them. And um, it is um, on sale through June 8th, and then we go live, but you can also grab the recording. You can grab that at um, reactiveeducation.com slash FND mini course. And if you're here, thank you so much. Thank you for these like great insights, great comments. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, oh, one more. Um, yeah, so in December 2019, my symptoms were like a paraplegic person. I'll never will give up to get in better motion. Yeah, so we do see a lot of folks that are like they've had a spinal cord injury um, and have paralysis of, of their legs and their trunk. Um, and um, yes, it does. I appreciate you saying I will never give up. It can be a lot of work to to make that reconnection. So thank you so much for for that comment. And um, if you are joining us, if you're not already on our newsletter, join us. I'm sending out these videos. I have um, articles. I'm going to send out this article that I shared today on the functional dystonia versus idiopathic dystonia. I will. I'm sending that all all out today along with the videos. Um, from this week. If you're a clinician, join at reactiveeducation.com. If you are a patient, join at reactivept.com. And you won't get all of the emails about these courses that we're doing um, as, as a patient. So um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I appreciate you all. And have a wonderful weekend. I will see you next week.